Again, thanks uh, for joining us this morning. I want to just clarify two things. One is that arrangement that we just sang, I Surrender All. Aaron, are you, I think he's coming up here. Uh, just to clarify, Aaron and Aston, who has this beautiful voice from this position, they're the ones that what, you created that, right? You wrote it. It's not like they copied it from some other mega church thing. And so it is definitely a gift they have that we look forward to. They have a great one on God's faithfulness as they've listened to us as a church that they wrote and that we are hopefully gonna be sharing with you very, very soon. So anyway, thank you for that. It is a gift that I don't have, but he does. And we look forward to to hearing that again. So thank you very much, sir. And then also, uh, let me clarify on that fifth Sunday, that is also Mark and Rachel's last Sunday with us before we send them out and release them to uh, the bridge in Chino. And so you'll wanna be here for that. They'll share a little bit also during our service and you could say your goodbyes as we celebrate and have a lunchtime together. So I just wanted to to, to put that out there for you. Uh, But again, we are in our series uh, on prayer. And if I were the uh, game show host of the Family Feud, I would start off by saying, okay, we have surveyed 100 people hopefully 100 normal people, you know, and have asked what activity, uh, what activity does somebody who loves Jesus do? What do they do? And so what are some of those things? You can just holler them out. I don't have a big board. That would have taken way too much time to create for us. But what are some of the things that, that Christians do? Pray. Well, okay, pray. Good. I heard go to church and pardon Okay, thank God. Eat. Eat. Okay. <laughs> I guess Mark's stuck on our dining and eating with Jesus. Uh, what else? Read the Bible. Yes, and so all of those are, are attribute, attribute bleh, yeah, things that, that we do as people who, who love Jesus. And really the top answer uh, for most people, if you surveyed them, would be prayer. And I think we know that. And we all want to be more a people of prayer, but it is just at times easier said than done. And that's what we've been talking about. And that's why you know, we started off the series, it seems forever ago, but it wasn't, on the Lord's Prayer, on the classic prayer that the Lord taught his disciples. And then I was able to, sh- to share with you about contemplative prayer and about a focused prayer. And then Mark came in and he talked about a a structured prayer. And just because it's been written by somebody else or because you structure it, that you put it into your day intentionally, you know, maybe morning, noon and night or morning and night or whatever way you try to make it intentional, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything, that it isn't sincere. It's just the idea that without being intentional, our prayer life soon becomes nothing. And so those are, again, folks, those are, you've heard these illustrations. Those are just, j- just tools in your tool bag on how to follow Jesus. Or they are just tools in your discipleship bag on what it means to follow Jesus, contemplative prayer and, you know, and focusing on the Lord's prayer and all that entails on who God is and what God does for us and praying for others. So geez, are, these are just tools in your toolbox. But one of the tools in there is a tool that on prayer that we would probably, many of us would call a specialty tool. I don't know about you, but uh, more than once I've bought those tool kits, uh, it'll probably age me, from Sears. Now Sears may not have the, I'm not even gonna say what they're gonna have the best of, uh, uh, but tools, I'll just leave it at tools and tires back in the day. Okay, uh, you get these you know, for X amount of money, you get all these different tools, you know, and then some of them you're looking at, what is this? I'm sure it's good for something, but you just never use it. Uh, And I think in our tool bag of discipleship, there is a prayer in there that we, when we pull it out, we're like, what is this? What do I do with this? And that would be the prayer Uh, of called fasting. Now fasting is a prayer that brings us 
into the presence of God. But I am very convinced that most of us will look at that as a tool, a special tool that at times we're like, I don't, I'm sure it's good for something, Lord, but I, maybe not me here today. And so that's what we are going to be focusing in on. Uh, John Wesley has says this about fasting. He says, some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason. And others have utterly disregarded it. And I am going to guess, we're not of the faith tradition where you have to confess something to me if I was a priest, but I would bet, if I was a priest, I probably wouldn't bet. But anyway, uh, that most of us err on the side of absolutely disregarding it. It's just not a part of at least how I was brought up. It's just not a part, an everyday part of our conversations, the idea of fasting. So that's what we're going to dive into. And let me pray. Lord, I am thankful for the people here. I am thankful for people like, like Aaron and, and Aston who can uh, bring together the, uh, the old and the new. Uh, the classic and some new ways of expressing our faith uh, through the gift of music. I'm thankful for people who come in here who, who today maybe uh, is the only time they prayed all week. I'm thankful for those who come in who are trying to figure you out and who you are and, and what you're about. I'm thankful for those senior saints that have loved you for years and years and years and to pray for us as a church. And so again, as I often do, Lord, I, I just simply pray that the thoughts that are going on in the hearts of, of these, your people, and the words that come from my mouth today, that they will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. God's people said, oh, if we don't do something the right way, we get zapped with something bad. Again, I'm not convinced that's the correct theology about our creator. And then there's nothing magical about it. Fasting doesn't manipulate God to do what you want God to do. So keep, keep that in mind as you think about it. Fasting, uh, while it is healthy, We'll talk about it a little bit later. While it's healthy, it is not the primary reason that we fast. And fasting is not God's way to lose weight. Now, some of us could do a little bit more fasting, trust me. But the, while you may lose a few pounds here and there, uh, fasting was not designed by God so I could drop a few pounds. Amen to that. So, uh, but again, let me talk about again what it is. I mentioned it earlier, but again, folks, it is another way of, uh, of, of explaining it is that fasting helps us to discern God's will. Remember I talked about the couple together so much they know what each other's thinking. It really helps us to understand God better. And then to have that, that power and that strength, and if I could use the word, that put those together, that spiritual power to act in accordance to God's desire. Fasting helps get us in that place. And if we think about uh, the people uh, in God's story, that would be called the Bible, we think of the people throughout scripture, fasting happened naturally. Uh, just as giving, as praying, as serving, they are all a part of what it means to be like Jesus. Jesus didn't say if you fast, nor did he say you must. It is just a normal part of the Christian life. So let's take a look at Matthew 6, 16 through 18. And that is on pages 678 or 679 in the Bibles in front of you, which you're welcome to take. So you can swipe to it, push to it, or however way you want to get to it. But let's look at Matthew 6, 16 through 18, and it's up here on the screens. So again, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. 
But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Typically saying, look normal. Uh, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, Jesus says it is, uh, it's, it's, when you fast, it's just assumed that it is a part of your life when you fast. It's like when you breathe, when you walk, you do all those things. When you fast, it's just a natural expectation in the Christian experience. In fact, it's not even just in the Christian, but many faiths fast. And there's something about that that we need to, to probably dive into. And again, the, the, the verse talks about, you know, don't, don't, make it a, a, don't make it a scene about it. Don't, oh, poor, you know, poor me, you know, I'm fasting so I can't, can't show up for the dinner. Poor me, you know, you just be Mr. Grumpy all day because you're, quote, fasting. Again, we'll talk about some of those practical ways that, that those things don't happen. It's not a show to people. It's not a thing to say, I am better than you, and therefore I'm fasting today. Jesus, again, is reminding us uh, that it's, it is just an opportunity to connect with our creator. And so throughout scripture, there are plenty of examples of fasting. So I am going to, these are not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to buzz through them quickly for you so that uh, you can get an idea that fasting isn't just a, a, uh, a modern day bro, uh, a spiritual approach to the, to the uh, abyss. But that throughout scripture, fasting uh, is pretty, pretty common. In Luke uh, 2, 37, there was a widow uh, until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. In Luke 4, 4, 2, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, Jesus, he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. Yeah, you, you're going to get hungry with fasting. That's the humanity of Jesus that we see there. In Daniel uh, 10, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. I used no lotions at all until three weeks were over. I am not suggesting a three-week fast. Uh, go gather, and in Esther 4, go gather all of the Jews uh, who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I, I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. In Deuteronomy, when I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord had made with you, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water. In 2 Corinthians, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. It is just a natural part of the people of God. And yet I just think it just has slipped in our culture to something, something other than that. You know, when I was, was in Michigan uh, this past summer at my buddy's house, you know, every Sunday uh, he invites uh, kids over uh, to ski and, and play volleyball and stuff. Well, this past year, he has gotten involved with the local university with their international student, student, well, the university calls it international students, but it's really an international student ministry. And he has become a conversationalist, meaning uh, students from all over the world just want to meet with somebody once a week uh, to, to have a, an, an English conversation. But in that, uh, they can be brought to church, they can have prayers. If he has devotions at dinner time, these international students are all about that. And so the Sunday I was there, there were like 40 kids there. These are, it was like the United Nations people. This was in West Michigan, predominantly white people. And so I am sure it shook up the lake people a little bit to see what was going on here. But they were here water ski. They, some of these kids had no idea how to swim. And yet they were on this speedboat 
you know, and I would make jokes about, you better be believing in the right God if you go under, you know. And so we had these nice little conversations and we bantered, bantered back and forth. But at the end of the day, at the end of that day when there was food left over, these students, uh, many from Saudi, uh, uh, they were Saudi and uh, Iranians, they said, oh, we don't need the food because tomorrow we fast. Wait, we're not going to fast tomorrow. We did last week. No, we're going to fast. And there were a half a dozen of them just uh, bantering back and forth, talking about their fast. It was like it was no big deal. This was a natural part of their faith. They fasted. And yet, I don't recall almost any conversations with anybody uh, like that about fasting uh, any, any Christians. I was just like, I mean, they're not holding in above any, anybody's head. Uh, they're just saying, no, no, we don't need the food for tomorrow. And then you're like, yeah, you're going to need that. Their fast was over at five. You're going to need that five because you're going to eat like a pig at five. And the other guy goes, well, I can't eat like a pig because it's pork. You know, anyway, so they have all these funny little discussions uh, inside their own faith. But fasting was just a natural part of their conversations. And I think, you know what? We can learn something from that. Again, if we, I think if we learn the, the lost art of fasting and enjoy what that uh, is to bring to us, uh, we're going to see that it is the church, us, people, collectively, that influence society versus society influencing us about really what fasting is about. Because if you go on the medical field, and we've talked about this before, talk to any medical doctor, he'll say that fasting is good. Because again, let me, let me read this. Uh, many doctors would say that it does wonders for our digestive systems, can impact sugar levels, carbs, help lose some weight, and help detox our bodies from, from all the horrible toxins that, that we are ingesting. You know, so, so just from a health perspective, it's good. But I want to <clears throat> be sure that when we fast, it's not just for health. Because as believers in Jesus, when we fast, it again, it puts us in that ripe place, so to speak, in that good place where we can really focus on, on who God is and what he has for us. And again, while those, while those studies are, are powerful and convicting. And when you're sitting at the doctor's office, he says, you, you need to do this. Uh, you almost want to say, of course. It just reminds me that before the doctor's reports, before all the health studies, we again, we read in, in Matthew, but when you fast, it's nothing new. It's been around for centuries. And then a, first, and a, a few verses later, in Matthew 9, 15, we read this. Jesus answered, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? A time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Again, it's an analogy uh, that, to say that nobody, you know, when, when there's a good old wedding feast, Nobody's sad at that feast. It's when the people, when the bride and groom were, in this case, in the church, when Christ leaves, that's when people will be mourning. And now the good news is, is that when we're re reunited for all of eternity, because God is there in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we don't need to fast. That's the good news, at least for some of us who like to eat. Uh, but until then, we are called to fast that they will fast. Again, he doesn't say, here's an idea that may help you in your spiritual growth. Here's a suggestion to help you connect with me and my father. He says, when you fast. And so I just think it's something that for most of us, me included, I need to bump that up on my priority list a little bit more. And again, in a few minutes, I'll share some, some tips on how to do that. Again, fasting, uh, I think it's easier said than done. It's like, again, like saving money in the bank. We know we should do it, but it's easier said than done. And it almost goes back to Mark's message last week about scheduled uh, uh, prayer, scheduling some time for a fixed prayer. 
Because if you put it in your calendar, you're going to likely do it more than if you just leave church today and say, yep, hey, that's not a bad idea. I should probably fast. But so what is going to be your next step? Uh, fasting is, is really, again, folks, it's getting a handle. It, uh, it's getting a grip. It's getting really God's perspective on our world. And as we talked about prayer, we talk about it often as aligning my heart with the heart of God. And how does that happen? Now, how do I align, align my heart with God's heart? And one suggestion in your toolbox is that of fasting. For some of us, it's going to be a stretch. We're really going to be not stretching our stomachs. We'll be stretching our hearts to get a fresh look at ourselves and who our creator is as we live out, live out our life. And so you, most of you, are a smart group of people. Again, you don't need to raise hands or point to somebody who isn't next to you. Uh, and so I think you understand that fasting is just normal and it should happen. And most of us, again, if we had the system to, can you, do you think fasting is, is a healthy thing and a biblical thing? Most of you would hit your iPads or your phones and say yes, and we have a survey here where my guess is almost every one of you would say, fasting, yeah, you know, I, you know what, Pastor? Yep, I'm convinced. And so again, because I know it is easier said than done, I'm going to give you just six ways, just six, I've condensed it, trust me, six ways to, to put fasting on your radar and how to make that happen. Now, these aren't completely original. I borrowed from Davis Mathis. He's the author of Habits of Grace, Enjoying Jesus Through Spiritual Disciplines. And again, you can Google. I mean, there are a, a ton of resources out there, but I've tried to narrow it down to six easy things. And again, they're available. The, these notes are at the Information Center if you would like them. But the first thing to remember is that uh, it's, uh, it starts small and don't forget to pray. Because some of you can be so nervous, oh, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. You know, you get, get so wrapped up in the idea that, uh, that you're fasting that you forget to pray. You get so wrapped up in the idea that I don't have breakfast today. You get so focusing on, you're not having breakfast that you start to starve and then you're in, in real big trouble. Uh, so just start small and pray. For those of you who have never fasted, uh, start off with, oh, you know, I need, this is one of these cover your behind statements. Uh, for any of us, you should probably check with your doctor before you fast. Okay? So let me just say that out there. You need to check with your doctor before you fast, just, for, just to cover us and to cover you that you're in the right health to be able to do that. Because I understand for some people, it, you just can't do that. So check with your doctor. And if you haven't fasted, you know, I'm going to say start off with just one meal a week. Not a day. I mean, don't start off fasting for a day. Fast for just one meal. And that's not when you wake up late and rush off the door to the office and say, oh, that was my fast. You know, because uh, we'd all say, I've been there about a few times this week. Uh, or I've worked through lunch. That isn't a fast. That's, that's another subject. Uh, but okay, one meal, one time a week for several weeks. And then you increase that to two meals for a few weeks. And then when you get to the point you can handle the full day, then go for the full day. And I'm not saying you need to fast every week. But my guess is most of us probably haven't fasted once in the past year, or maybe during Lent, I'll give it, you know, I, okay, yeah, I felt a little convicted, so there was a couple days during Lent I fasted. So uh, let's, let's be realistic in that most of us probably have not fasted much in the past year. Uh, and if things get bad uh, during your fast, you know, uh, suggestions are just drink a little cup of juice. Not a gallon of the orange juice because you're gonna have another problem a little bit later, but just drink a little juice to help you through that fast and to give you some nutrients. Some go on a juice fast where there's no food. Again, the juice does then supply you with some nutrients to help you through the day. And if you need that, I would say then go ahead and do that. We're not being legalistic here. So there's a difference of here are some rules, do's and don'ts. 
It's here are some suggestions to help you take that step into connecting with God in a much better, not better, in a much deeper way, okay? And then the next thing is plan what you're going to do instead of eating. So if you work through lunch, or if you're busy doing yard work and you, 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 all of a sudden it's three o'clock, again, uh, you did nothing to connect you with God during that time. You were just working. And so the idea of a fast is to, what are you going to do instead of working? Is, is Pastor Ricky here? Oh, uh, Sarah, what did, Pastor Ricky brought me some food this week, that chicken with the peanut, what's that called? Yeah, saute. Anyway, if you haven't had it, you need to. He brought me this huge bag of this chicken and you put this peanut sauce on it. Well, I had that for three meals this week. You know, I don't mind the same meal. Uh, but it's amazing at the time you save, not going shopping, not preparing it. And so fasting saves you that time, saves you that energy. And so what are you going to be doing intentionally during that time uh, instead of eating? Because otherwise you're just going to starve and there's no reason to fast if you're just going to starve. You might as well have the burger and call it a day. All right, so let me, I'm gonna rifle through again just some things about uh, uh, to have on your to-do list while, while uh, fasting. Again, these are on, on the list. You know what, maybe you can pray for a loved one. If you're considering a job change, you can pray for the place that you're currently at and then you can pr- pray for the place you are going to. Maybe you can write a note uh, to somebody you've prayed for. Maybe you need to, to reach out to some friends. Take, take some note cards and some envelopes and some stamps and, and literally write them during your fasting. Maybe you need to write in your own journal. And that's just a fancy word for paper. You know, grab some paper and write, write out your prayers if you need to. Maybe it's an extended time of some worship where it's some prayer time as well as some music And you are just set in that for a while, just to settle you down. You know, maybe you're gonna, maybe you fall asleep. That's okay. That's probably God's way of saying, okay, you need a little nap. So wake up from it and then continue trying to connect to God while you are are awake. Don't don't fight it, folks. Another thing is, you know what? Uh, Read through your favorite chapter in the Bible. It's like, what do I do for a fast? I've never done a fast before. You know, go through your favorite chapter in the Bible. Or just be thinking, uh, pull out your Bible, and if you've ever uh, put an asterisk by a verse or underlined some favorite verses, start to pull those out and make a list of them. Uh, and, and that list is never a permanent list, trust me. You're always going to be updating it. Computers are wonderful for that. And then printing it out. So then whether you travel or you get some other time alone, you can be reviewing that list and even trying to commit to memory. At least if you fasted one day a month, if you memorized one verse a month, you'd have 12 verses of scripture memorized. And my guess is most of us have not memorized 12 verses in the past year. So keep that in mind. Anyway, uh, you can think about those who are in need in your life group. Uh, are we going by a list here? So I'm all over this list. So if you want to really follow it by, by order, it is in the, in, the, uh, in the back there. I was just skipping through these. You can pray for your church and you can pray for us as, as your pastors. You can pray for our government leaders. Uh, you can pray again for those who have recently lost a loved one that, that you know. Folks, if you don't have a plan, you're not gonna, nothing's gonna happen. Let's just face it. You're going to starve yourself. At one hand, you're going to think, oh, I fasted. On the other hand, you're going to be pretty frustrated. It's like, what did I do that for? I should have just ate. And I, and I think I've, I've shared before that I was in a fast once. It was on a Friday. I don't work on Fridays or try not to work on Fridays. And about four o'clock, I was, was grumpier than grumpy. I mean, I was just ticked. And there was really no reason. My daughter was doing okay. The car was running house was doing fine. There was, there were no flags going off that was just pushing some buttons. I was just miserable. If my wife was still alive, she would have kicked me out of the house. It was, I was just like, I was self-aware enough to know I was not in a good place. 
And I realized, oh, I was supposed to be fasting. And all I did was not eat, but I didn't have a plan. And so it was like, well, that was a waste. So I went and I saw a movie and ate some popcorn. Uh, and I'll do it again some other day. But all I'm saying is that, you know, if you fail, do it again. It's not one of those things that you try and, and they go, okay, that didn't quite work. I've had people say, hey, I was going to fast for the whole day, but, you know, at 8 o'clock I finally had to get something. Is God going to still love me? Of course. People, all these things about prayer that we've been teaching, uh, these things don't make God love you anymore. You could fast for three days a week, and it doesn't mean that God's going to love you more than God already loves you. It's not by works that we are saved. It's by the grace of God. And so remember, all these, these tools in the toolbox, they aren't, they aren't redeemable chips to, to our creator that he's going to love us more. He already loves us. These are for our purpose, to draw us closer to him so that we can know the heart of God. And so, okay, the, the, that was, let's say that was the third one there. Uh, okay, no, you need to consider how it's going to affect others. Okay, that's where my grumpiness comes in. You know what? If, if, if I'm that bad, then skip the fast. Because me fasting doesn't give me an excuse to be mean to people. Me fasting doesn't give me the excuse to, or to, to, be, to be rude uh, to, to my daughter, or if I was married, rude to my wife, or rude to, to the people at work, even though we work at a church. Fasting isn't, that doesn't give you the green light to be arrogant about doing what you're doing. Again, fasting is something that you do that brings you closer to God. And if you have some some uh, routine things. If it's the if it's the lunch, if it's the office lunch on Wednesdays, then don't fast. Because what are you can do? Sit there. And go, oh, what's going up with Joe over here? I don't know. He's just not eating. You know, and it all becomes and all of a sudden it becomes about Joe and not about your time with God. So use you know, like I've shared. You know, don't fast on Thanksgiving. I mean, that'd be be pretty silly. I mean. Why would you do that anyway? Uh, but everyone's going, what's going on? But Uncle Gino, he's not eating today. Oh, he's fasting. No, that isn't the purpose of it. The purpose of it isn't to put other people down because you're so superior. The purpose of it is in, in, in my quiet time, how can I connect to God? You know, and, this, and another one is different types of fasting. I mean, I'm sorry, different styles. styles. I have a fast with myself. Maybe I challenge the staff. I can do that at a church. Hey, let's have Tuesday a fasting day for us as we prepare for the fall. Well, let's have, you know, since Mark and Rachel are leaving, that's going to be a big shift for us. Let's have a day of fasting, how we're going to reorganize in the interim to, to help the church grow, to be new life for the city with two key people leaving. And so uh, change up that fast a little bit. Maybe as a congregation, uh, maybe I should do that for the whole congregation. Hey, let's be, be thinking how God is going to, to reshape us and form us as a congregation as we rethink we have two staff openings and what's going to happen. And so there are different, uh, different styles of fasting. And Scripture, all nations have fasted. I don't think we're quite there as the United States. But that probably wouldn't hurt us as the United States. And then fast from something other than food. We talked about that earlier. Uh, uh, hobbies, habits. Uh, but maybe particular foods. We're used to this kind of fasting from the whole thing of we call Lent. And so it may not be just food, but it could be other, other behaviors. And finally, like I've mentioned, it's easier said than done. But keep at it. Because we know what's the best thing. We know it really does help us to center ourselves, not on me, but on who God is. And it helps me to present these big issues that, that maybe are pressing in on my heart. Maybe it's increasing my anxiety, but, but fasting helps me to bring these into God's presence. And so I know it's, again, people, I know it is easier said than done. I know it's potentially one of those specialty tools that we never use, but the challenge is I think we need to. We need to figure out this thing called fasting and figure out what that looks like for us in our own culture, and in our own uh, rhythms of life. And I think as we do that, 
I think as each of us individually, as we connect more with God, we're gonna figure out who we are, what, what wires us, how God has gifted us. And we're just gonna find the right place for God to use us. So collectively, we can make a statement in our city and we can really be new life for the city. God's people said, amen. I'm gonna invite the worship team back out here uh, to lead us in our response time. And as you know, there are numerous ways to respond. Uh, One of them will be by the giving of your offerings. And so in a few minutes, the uh, the ushers will come forward and they're going to receive the gifts that you have to give back to God. That reminds us that we're not, we're not uh, tied to our financial resources, but they are a gift from God and we give those back to God. You can light a candle and maybe today it's to say, Lord, help me to connect with you on a, on a deeper level. Maybe there's some darkness in your life that you need to bring the light of Jesus to. Maybe you wanna come up here or in the back or when the rovers are coming around uh, to take the bread and to take the juice as a reminder of the grace uh, that we have because of Jesus. Remind you of the love that we have that reminds you that no matter what you do or you don't do, the love of Jesus is still there for each and every one of us. And so as the band uh, worship team comes back out here, uh, we're gonna start off uh, with, a, with a song that if you... Uh, Looked at my email this week. I put a link to it. It's, it's, a, it's a new song, for us, but it is a great song. And I set you up for that knowing that I just maybe have messed up some expectations there. Uh, but I just, if you haven't heard it, you know, listen to it. It is a song that speaks deeply into the reality that God is our provider, is our provider in each and every aspect of our life. And so if you don't know the words, you know, make this song your prayer. Make this song your prayer, uh, not just today, but throughout the week, that you will be reminded that he is our provider in each and every area of our life. So let us respond.